Geopolitical Horizon, the podcast of geopolity.com. Now, today we want to continue with our geopolitics series. We want to turn our attention to the different regions of the world. I want to take this time to thank the audience. You guys have sent so many questions and different topics. And most of the questions, they're around this idea of how can we improve our understanding of the world. So in the light of this, we wanted to carry on with this geopolitics series. Before we looked at key countries, now we want to look at the different regions in the world. So the second segment of this series is looking at the various world's regions. And we're going to begin with Europe. Obviously, we've got our geopolity founder, Adnan Khan. How are you keeping, Adnan? I'm good, Yusuf. Uh, how are you doing? I'm okay. How's the weather down south? Uh, it's getting warmer. It's getting, it's getting warmer. warmer. We, we've just had nothing but rain up here. Yeah, you are really at the wettest part in the UK, aren't you? <laughs> now, before we delve into Europe, I want to ask you, how did you come up with this idea of, of separating the world into different regions? Yeah, how, how does that actually help someone understand the world? Okay, that's actually a good question, Yusuf. We've looked at the key countries... And that gives us a good insight into the character of these powers, what they're up to. And that's helpful to understand what these nations potentially could be doing. What that doesn't do, however, is give us the more detailed information of what's going on around the world. So you can know America, American foreign policy establishment, America's strength, all of these sort of things. But what is that actually America doing in the world? What is it doing in Central Asia, in Africa, in Southeast Asia? So that requires us to have more information of what's specifically going on in the different regions of the world. So looking at the world in terms of a, from a regional perspective, that is one way amongst probably many you could look at the world. But I feel there are some advantages when you have a good grasp of what's taking place in different regions of the world. And the reason why that is, is, if you look at political actions, there are many in the world and they relate to many issues. But we find that even the world's powers, they do look at the world from a regional perspective. So America, for example, it halves up the world in terms of its foreign policy establishment, even the State Department. It's organized on the regions of the world, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa. We find if you look struggle and competition between the different powers in the world, it takes place in different regions. So the struggle in Africa between the global powers is different to the struggle in Central Asia. We see also that the people of Africa and Latin America, they're both in liberation struggles against the West, but they themselves do not see themselves as one people because they see themselves as in different regions. So the struggles do differ because they're in different regions of the world. So most political actions that take place, they're shaped by the region they're in. So the colonialism of Africa has shaped that region. Whilst the reality of Central Asia is different to Africa because the reality of struggle and the fact that Central Asia was under the Soviet Union and communism for so long makes it different. So each region has its own dynamics. And that's why looking at the world from a regional perspective, I think is a good way and it's a good way to structure the world. Now, it doesn't always mean things or issues can neatly fit into different regions. But I think it's actually a uh, good start. So understanding what's going on in any region would actually give you a good grasp of what's taking place at the world. Now, you didn't mention the Arctic as a region or space, uh, but obviously these we see these are as emerging new regions. So Yusuf, I'm very happy you're on the ball today. You're ahead of the curve. So you're right, the Arctic and space are emerging as new regions and competition has already started. So if we look at the Arctic, it's now really opening up. Ships are now traversing the region because before it was blocked by ice. So already we're seeing competition over trade routes and resources. But really, we're at the beginning part of this process. So I don't. we don't plan to look at the Arctic as a region in this series. It probably needs a podcast on its own. But really, it means we need to be aware that this could be a region going forward. And similarly with space, we now have the technology to make the 240,000 mile journey to the moon. And we see different nations have capabilities now to reach the moon and even beyond. So we're really seeing now the early parts of a new space race. And we're seeing now the search for resources on asteroids. We're looking at the potential setting up of colonies on the moon. 
We're looking at space-based uh, weapons coming into existence and even access to new energy sources. So we won't really look at this space as a region in this series because it's really just emerging. But maybe that is a podcast for the future, Yusuf. So if we get into Europe now, looking at Europe, what are the most important features we need to we need to look at and understand in order to actually make sense of Europe? Okay, so the first place to start, Yusuf, is what is Europe? We need to define what Europe is as a geographical region. And that isn't as easy as it may sound or as easy as someone might originally think. So generally, Yusuf, when we're talking about Europe, we're talking about on one side, you've got Portugal up to the UK in the west, and then all the way to the other side, really to the Baltics and St. Petersburg in Russia in the northeast, to rostov on don in the southeast. And rostov on don has recently been in the news because that is where the main military base is for Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. We also see that Europe then stretches from the Mediterranean and the Black Sea in the south, all the way to the North Sea in the Baltics up to the north. So access to all these seas is one of the reasons why Europe came very, very rich. The problem we have when we want to define Europe is where does the border of Europe end and where does the border of Russia begin? And if you look at a map, Yusuf, you see this border has constantly moved throughout history. So you see the Europeans have always been trying to push this border deeper into Russia. And the Russians have always been trying to push this border deeper and deeper into Europe. So we find the use of during the Cold War, this border went all the way up to Germany. We see in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed, this border moved all the way to the Ukrainian border. So this border, you know, it's not fixed. European boundaries are not fixed. They've constantly moved over uh, history. The other main feature of Europe is the Northern European plain. Now, this is an area of land that begins in France. It's a low land. It has, it's a flat land. And it starts from the north of France. It goes through Germany. And then it begins to open up. And it becomes a 1,000 mile front when you get to Russia. And it goes all the way into Russia. Now, why is this important? It's important because this low land is easy to traverse. And if the direction armies have constantly gone to conquer. So Napoleon... He used this land to go and conquer the rest of Europe. The Russians have used this land to conquer further into Europe. And we see Germany twice has done this as well. So the Northern European plain is a very important feature that helps understand Europe. Then we also need to understand, Yusuf, there are really two Europes. There's not one Europe. There's the North and the South. The North of Europe, so we're talking about France, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about Belgium, Holland. We're talking about the UK and the Nordic areas. These are regions that are full of rivers. The, these are, and this is actually an area that has the most densely packed rivers in the world. So what happened was it allowed them to trade internally and become very, very rich. It's also the region that colonized the whole world and became very, very rich. The south of Europe, though, you're looking at Italy, you're looking at the Balkans. This is his, uh, mountainous territory. And historically, this region struggled to access the world's oceans and trade. And as a result, even today, you find Southern Europe is poor, while Northern Europe is rich. And this creates a big problem because the Northern Europeans fuel, they're putting more and more money into the EU, whilst the Southern Europe, the Balkan and these areas, they should be taking more and more money out of the EU. So the North and South divide isn't new. It's actually a historical feature of this region. And then finally, although Europe is one continent, so as to say, it's always consisted of different people, different cultures, and different languages. As a result, the region, although it's one on the map, it's very fragmented, and this has led to many, many, many wars over the centuries. And Dan, can you tell me more, a little bit more about the European people? I know you mentioned that they're all from different backgrounds and different cultures. Okay, so something European people, we could probably organize into five categories. You've got the Northern Europeans, you've got the Germanic Europeans, You've got European in Central and Eastern Europe, and then you've got Southern Europe. So Northern Europe, we're talking about France, the UK, the Nordic areas. These people were reformist, they were Protestant, and they've dominated European uh, history. Largely what they say is what happens in Europe and is where much of the wealth of Europe is. Then you've got the Germanic people. So this is Austria or what has become Germany today. 
Germany was established at the center of Europe, it became a hub of trade and investment. However, this area is vulnerable to invasion. So they have their own culture. They have their own uh, language as well. Then you've got Central and Eastern Europe. You could call the, the borderlands uh, of Europe. And these areas have been contested by various powers. Now we can split those into two, Central and Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe is the area within Russia's sphere. And Russia has always had influence over these people. And in fact, the Russian border has actually expanded to over these people that has a big impact on the view of the world uh, today. So although most of these are part of the European Union today, Russia has a massive uh, influence over them. Then you've got the Central European states. And what you find with them is they are really a buffer between uh, the European powers and uh, Russia. And this had a big impact on their psyche as well. And then finally, you've got Southern Europe. So this is the area south of the Alps. So you've got Italy and you've got the Balkans, and they are physically separate from the rest of Europe. And this has had a big impact on their cultural development or, or on how they, they see themselves. So even today, you know, Southern Europe is physically separate from the rest of Northern Europe. Now, I know, I know you say the North and South divide has been there for a long time. But what comes to mind is Greece and Rome. They're technically Southern Europe, but they dominated European history. How does that fit in? So a discussion of Greece and Rome is really a discussion of European history. So you can't, you know, the Greece was the first civilization of Europe, went and conquered a chunk of the world. And as we know, then the Romans came after them. So in fact, a discussion about ancient Greece and the Roman Empire is really a discussion of global politics, although we're talking about ancient history. So ancient Greece, it gave the Western world its first culture and philosophy. So we're talking from the 8th to the 4th century BC. Greece consisted of city-states, and they were only unified, interestingly, Yusuf, for 13 years under Alexander the Great in 300 BC. So really, although today Greece is one nation, in ancient Greece, they were actually city-states, and that's what they're actually quite famous for, being these uh, city-states that used to compete with each other. So Thucydides, he gave birth to geopolitics with his writing of the Peloponnesian War. And this was a war between Sparta, which was a, a military city-state, and Athens, who considered themselves intellectuals and philosophers. Now, use of their position on the Mediterranean and the fact that they developed a navy is what allowed them to dominate the region. This was a key for the economic success. So because of their access to the Mediterranean, the seas, that's how they became a power in the region. And they went through many, many wars with the Persians who competed with them. Regarding the Roman Empire, so obviously, as we know, in 753 BC, that's considered the birth of Rome. And the Romans established a mighty empire which still shapes much of the European history. Rome was ruled by a succession of emperors and military generals, and some were good and some were just plain uh, mad. And they constantly expanded by organizing their armies to go subjugate others and to seize their wealth. This approach worked for a long time, as there was always new lands to conquer over the hill. But eventually, the cost of maintaining the lands that were conquered was draining their treasury, and not even uh, bread and circuses could uh, save them. So eventually the Roman leaders entered into a number of disastrous wars, and this was really the final nail in the coffin for the Romans. Interestingly, this was the same blueprint that was used later by the imperial powers of conquering other lands and seizing their, their wealth. And then eventually Rome was overrun by Germanic tribes in 476 AD. So the Roman and the Persians still have a massive impact on Europe. Many, many laws, much of the culture, much of the political orientation comes from these guys. So that's why really you do need to have a bit of an understanding of the ancient Greece and the Romans in order to understand Europe today. Until the 16th century, if we carry on with this Greece and Rome trajectory, until the 16th century, Europe was really just a backwater. What then led to the change when Europe then became the centre of the world? So, yeah, that's a good way to put things, Yusuf. Um, a study of the world seems to have become a study of the rise of Europe. Modernity, development, progress, for some reason, has been defined as the path 
the Europeans took. Apparently the world starts from the 16th century, before then it was the Dark Ages. That's the narrative they've actually put to it. So the rise of Europe, we need to go back to the Romans. As I mentioned, the Rome was overrun in 476. AD. This was the fall of Rome. And what happened was because Rome was so dominant over Europe, it left a vacuum. Now, a few hundred years before Rome fell, for at least 300 years, Rome oppressed Christianity. It even oppressed the descendants of the followers of Jesus. However, because Rome covered so many lands and had so many different people, eventually Rome adopted Christianity as the official belief of the empire in order to create a common mentality. So when Rome collapsed, the only organized institution was the church. So what you find is the fall of Rome, the political vacuum it left, eventually it led to the church to come and dominate the political sphere within Europe. So what this practically meant, Yusuf, was everything in Europe had to conform to the dogma of the church. Now this caused countless problems, given that the church followed the Bible, and the Bible only really dealt with limited matters. So the political sphere, the public sphere, it was an area of constant conflict between kings, barons, the aristocracy, and the priests from the church. And these problems really only grew as the centuries went on. And then eventually, by the 14, 1500s, it led to a huge challenge for the church. People could see that the church was corrupt. They were selling their offices. To get to God, you had to go through priests. And really what you find is in a 50 year period from 1492, the church suffered from major intellectual blows. And these were mainly three. The church used to believe and propagate that the earth was the center of the universe. Europe was the center of the world and that the church was the center of Europe. And these three ideas, they were challenged in a 50 year period. And this led to a massive intellectual blow and it led to the removal of the church and its position. And this is where we saw the emergence of uh, Europe. So it began with the idea that Europe was the center of the world. When Christopher Columbus was trying to find an alternative route to Asia, he was doing this for the Spanish monarchy. He, at that time, the only route really was you go through the Mediterranean, you go over the Middle East, and then you travel to India and China. What happened was because the Muslims controlled this route, the Europeans had to find an alternative route. So the Portuguese, they invested in explorers who went around Africa. And the Spanish at that time, they weren't as powerful as the Portuguese Navy. They then invested in Columbus who believed, and people didn't believe, although they hadn't proven, that you could go around the world and get to the Far East. So in 1492, he landed in what was Haiti. And this began the discovery of the Americas. So why was this an intellectual blow? It was an intellectual blow because people believed Christianity was the truth, but they now found that the whole other side of the world had never heard of Christianity. So this undermined the idea that Europe was the center of the world because there was a whole other world that they had never discovered. Then the church being the center of Europe, that was challenged. Martin Luther, a German priest, he challenged the church and its relationship with God because he found that the church was corrupt. So he famously exposed what the church was doing. And this is what actually led to the Reformation. What he did is what everybody believed that the church was actually corrupt. So the church's role came to be challenged. And his argument was very simple. We don't have to go to a priest to get to God. We can get to God ourselves. And what he was saying is we don't need the church. The church is corrupt. We can get to God ourselves. We can read the Bible ourselves. This challenged the church. Then in 1543, Copernicus, he disproved the theory that the earth was the center of the universe. Now, this was quite blasphemous uh, at the time. And he challenged this fact. So the ideas that had driven the world and Europe for five, 600 years, all of this came to be challenged. And what this created was a number of things. It meant that to understand the world, we don't need to understand the Bible. We just need to study the world, we just study nature. And we do this through science. And science, the development of scientific method was very critical to eventually the industrial revolution. So what they were saying was the Bible actually is based on superstition. It's about the supernatural. To study the world, you need to do science. And this really is what led to the development in Europe. It led to a revolution in thinking. And this is eventually what led to Europe to actually conquer the world as well. 
So what it also did, it led to new ideas that prioritised the individual over God. It prioritised freedom of thought over the Bible. It prioritised doubt and criticism, which is what the scientific method is. And more importantly, it led to the removal of God and the Bible over politics and legislation. And this really, it led to the period of enlightenment. And this is what really drove the awakening of Europe. Now, I've brushed over many of the key developments that happened, but those are probably a high level, the main developments that actually happened. It's probably a podcast on its own, really, the, the rise of Europe and all the different things. But really, once Europe got rid of the role of the church, you saw the shackles were off, and then that's where Europe went on and conquered the rest of the world. Okay, and then if you could just focus on a couple of key countries in Europe that actually had a massive effect on Europe as a whole. So maybe the likes of Britain, Germany. Okay, so you so probably, if we look at the region, the key countries historically have been Britain, France and Germany, and they still are today. You had Spain and Portugal as well, but they are not as powerful as they uh, used to be. They don't really shape the region uh, today. So yeah, Britain, France and Germany have historically played a major role in the region. So Britain is cut off from the European continent by the English Channel. So although Britain is not on the European continent physically, it is geographically on Europe. And this has worked in its favour. So what Britain has historically done, because Europe has always been at war, what Britain has done is kept away from warfare on Europe. But at the same time, if a power emerges on Europe, if a unified power emerges in Europe, if a collection of countries unify Europe, there will be a threat on the UK. So what Britain historically done is it's tried to create a balance of power on Europe and at the same time engage with the rest of the world. And at least I would say, Yusuf, for 100 years, from 1815 to World War I, Britain did this very, very successfully. So because European is not on the physical continent, it didn't have to worry about war, but it just had to worry about if a power emerged. So from that perspective, Britain had one leg in Europe, to make sure Europe didn't become unified. And then the other leg was in the rest of the world. So as we know, Britain went and established colonies in the Americas. It went and established colonies in India and the Far East. And what allowed it to do this is it didn't need to have a massive military defending the UK. It could do that. On the other hand, it did need to ensure that Europe never unified. But if Europe unified, then it could go to war. But so the Romans tried to conquer the British Isles. The French tried to conquer it. The Germans tried to conquer it. So this has always been Britain's view of how we should operate. And even now when Britain's Brexited, its view is that Europe and the EU is handcuffing the UK and the UK can influence Europe without actually having to be in the uh, EU. The French are at the centre of Europe. They played a very, very important role. The French tried to conquer the whole of Europe through Napoleon. After Napoleon, they've, uh, they were the central player to unify the European Union. So France has really been at the centre of European affairs. It's on the continent. On one side, it has Spain, and it has a big mountain range, so it didn't have to worry about invasion. In the south, it's got the Mediterranean. In the north, it's got the English Channel. Really, the only area France is exposed is in the northeast. And that's where the Northern European planes go into Germany. And that's why the biggest threat for France has historically been uh, Germany. So the French strategy has been is that they need to engage in European affairs. They need to ensure no power emerges and they need to ensure their borders protected. And this has really defined French politics and French geopolitics for most of its history. And then finally you have Germany. Germany is the youngest of many of the nations in Europe. Unified Germany only came into existence in 1871. And when it came to existence, it became a big problem for France. The German view is, is that the German lands were always a playground for European powers. So when Germany emerged as a nation, it had a big problem. On one side, it's got France, who has historically been at war with. On the other side, it's got Russia, who has also historically been at war with. And their solution to this problem was, is the conquest of both nations. And that's what World War I, World War II were about. The strategy was a quick conquest of France and then chuck all your troops to the east and go and conquer Russia. And they tried to do this twice with massive failure. Since World War II, they've tried to achieve this through the European Union. So an understanding of European politics is really an understanding of the dynamics between France, Germany and Britain. I haven't mentioned Russia here, Yusuf, and I think 
we need to put Russia's role in perspective. Russia, in many ways, is a European nation. European Russia is where most of Russia's population is. And historically, Russia has been heavily involved in European affairs. So although Russia is also an Asia power as well, most of Russia's politics is European. Most of Russia's important cities, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Stalingrad, which is called Leningrad today, these are all really in Europe. So Russia is also a European power. And as I mentioned before, the border between Europe and Russia has also had a big impact on the region. Understanding these four things, Britain, France, Germany and Russia, really gives you 90% of understanding the geopolitics of Europe. Uh, now, we've gone through key nations. What, what about key events that happened in European history? So I'm just going to name a few, one by one, actually, and if you can just briefly explain them and how they actually impacted Europe. So the first one, Peace of Westphalia, 1648. Okay, so the Peace of Westphalia, Yusuf, was the end of the 30-year war. The 30-year war was a war of religion. The Reformation had just happened. The church was being removed. So this was a war, really, between countries in Europe that were Protestant, they were reformist, and between those who supported the Catholic Church. So this was a brutal war. It mainly took place over what is Germany today, and it caused so much devastation in Europe that eventually it led to a peace conference in 1648. And what this conference did is it effectively said that if you are a monarch, your rule is only over the territories that you directly have connected to your land. You can't be ruling over territories that are really far from you. And what this did, Yusuf, is it effectively created the first borders in Europe. And those borders are eventually what became the nation states of Europe. So really, the Peace of Westphalia is a discussion of the origins of modern Europe. Uh, next one, Napoleon and his impact. So Napoleon was the man of destiny for the French. He came to power when the French Revolution had turned into a disaster. You had different revolutionaries in the French Revolution. Some were more extreme than others. So they weren't happy with the outcome of the overthrow of the monarchy. And in this crisis emerged the military general Napoleon, who brought peace to France through force. And then what he did, he used that as a premise to create a continental system with the revolutionary ideas of Fr French Revolution. He conquered France and then he conquered most of Europe. And his military victories and his constant victory is what shocked Europe. Europe had to gather a coalition of countries to stop him. And he kept uh, winning until his disastrous invasion of Russia where he lost most of his uh, forces, and then his invincibility was impacted. The Napoleonic system, the continental system, it didn't last beyond Napoleon. Napoleon was in power for 15 years, and after his defeat in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, the Europeans gathered in the Congress of Vienna, and what they did was all the monarchs were put back in power in Europe, and the French were given back their territory, and the conditions that were agreed at the Congress of Vienna is they remain for another 100 years until World War I. So Napoleon is a key figure in French history and he's actually a key figure in European history. Uh, what about World War I and II? So the emergence of Germany as a unified nation in 1871, it created fear in both France and Russia and it created fear in Germany because they realized that although they unified at the center of Europe, they've got enemies on their two borders. So their solution to this began in the late 1800s, which was that they would need to go to war with them. And if you start the war at a time of your own choosing, it gives you the advantage. And their strategy, which was all codified into the von Schieffen plan, which was de uh, developed by a German military general, and the plan was, is the encirclement of Paris and the quick conquest of France. And then you move to Russia to conquer the rest of Russia. So World War I was already on the card by 1850. So the World War I was the German solution to their geopolitical problem. Obviously, we know it failed. And World War II was the sequel to it. And it failed even more spectacularly. Although the Germans by 1940 had already conquered France and they were knocking on the doors of Russia. So the two world wars really were the German answer to this strategic problem. The European Union. So after World War II, Europe was devastated. 
And America was worried that communist Russia would become too attractive for most people of Europe. What the US said is the Europeans need to combine their industries and come up with some sort of method of economic development. And this was a big worry for America because they felt the impending threat of communist Russia over Europe. So what the Europeans eventually come up with was the European Union. And it began with the combining of the coal and steel industries, which were the key industries for weapons of war. And as the years went on, they started integrating their economies, their political strategies, and even their monetary policies as well. So today, the European Union is a union of 27 member states. Obviously, the UK has left. But it was an answer to the post-World War II challenge, which was devastated economies and how to deal with the threat of impending communism. Uh, the Cold War? So the Cold War was the situation after World War II, where the Soviet Union had an ideology, communism, and they wanted to expand it to the rest of the world. So the main battleground was the rest of Europe. So although the Soviet Union went all the way up to Berlin, the challenge really was, and the situation was, that they're going to try and conquer the rest of Europe. So America invested a lot of military equipment and a lot of political will to save Europe. The Soviet Union developed its military in order to expand communism. And the Cold War was the term that there was never a physical war between the, these countries. The war was really on the political front, supporting groups, supporting proxy groups, through proxies. And all of this is called the Cold War. And really, you know, the history of post-World War Europe until 1991 is really a study of understanding Cold War. And then what are Europe's key challenges at the moment? So I would say three Yusuf at the moment. You've got the erasure of Ukraine by Russia. You've got transatlantic relations. And then you've got the EU crisis. Now, the invasion of Ukraine has created a massive problem for Europe. This goes back to what we discussed before, which is the border between Europe and Russia is moving again. Uh, Russia, it stands poor against Europe. And defending Europe against Russia is a key strategic issue for the European powers. So this is the outcome of the Ukraine war will have huge ramifications for Europe going forward. Similar to the outcome of World War One and Two, the outcome of this war will determine the future of Europe. And we probably need a separate podcast for the specific developments. Transatlantic relations, they were rock bottom under Donald Trump. Donald Trump felt Europe was weak. He kept undermining different European leaders. The Joe Biden administration has tried to fix their relationship with Europe. The main challenge here is, is when the war began in Ukraine, all the European powers got behind America. America is leading the war against Russia in Ukraine. The Europe nations are standing with America. So there's a big question here of European independence. Can Europe stand on its own? Can it defend its territory on its own? Can it be an independent power? At the moment, there are serious question marks about the independence of Europe. And this is a major issue going forward. And finally, the European Union. Britain has left the European Union. It now means leaving the EU is a viable option. The European Union was a strategy to unite Europe and end warfare on the continent. But what we're finding now is you've got many anti-EU parties emerging. You've got many anti-EU factions within pro-EU nations. So the weakening or the collapse of the EU has massive ramifications on the future of Europe. And finally, Dan, what's Europe's long-term challenges? So the long-term trend, I would say, are three. You've got population decline. You've got global power shifting from west to east and Europe's energy dilemma. Europe's population is probably the biggest challenge it faces at the moment. Europe's population is in decline, and what population it does have is growing older and older. Now, when your population grows, you've got more people paying more taxes, you have more government budget able to invest in military and able to invest in the people. If your population is declining, you're going to have a massive problem. So you find use of the key nations in Europe. Germany is already in population decline. The French population is about to decline. And Britain's population would be declining if it wasn't for immigration. It's expected use of by 2050 
there will be 20 million less people in the EU workforce. And the main reason for this is, Yusuf, is the fertility rate. The number of children per woman is below the replacement rate. So you find use of 2.1 children per woman is the average fertility rate needed to have a stable population. Europe's fertility rate is about 1.6, 1.7. So it's already below the replacement rate. So this is going to be a massive problem for Europe going forward. The second crisis I mentioned is, is the Far East is emerging as the economic engine of the world. It's where China is. And for the last 500 years, Europe has been the center of the world. But this changed after World War II when America took over. And now you've got the emergence of the Far East. So really, the last 500 years have been dominated by Europe and the West. And if this is changing, it has a big impact. Why should Europe have a say over the world? Why should Europe be at the negotiating table on the main institutions when all the economic activity and all the political activity seems to be shifting to the West? So this is a challenge for Europe. And finally, Yusuf, European energy has always been a major challenge, but the Russian invasion of Ukraine has really brought the dilemma onto the surface. 50% of Europe's gas used to come from Russia. 96% of oil comes from Russia and half of European coal comes from imports. Now the main source of all these imports was Russia and that's no longer there. And there's no short-term fix, no immediate fix to these problems. There's a lot of long-term fixes, but they will take time. So this is a major problem Europe's going to be facing. So population decline, power shifting from the west to the east, and Europe's energy dilemma. Thanks for your time today, Adnan. If you want to learn more about the issues we've raised today, please check out our website, www.thegeopolicy.com, all one word. You can also learn more about many other issues by accessing our website where you'll find comprehensive insights, analysis, articles and deep dives. Thank you for listening.